In my last video, I built a guitar sustainer mechanism for my Fulgorian harp. And it worked okay, but these little inductor coils that I'm using were just way too weak. So today, I want to explore the physics of how these things actually work so that I can understand how I would go about either making or finding better ones. And if you recall, my setup consisted of a metal guitar string and two coils an input coil and an output coil, and I want to start today by analyzing the input coil, which is basically just a guitar pickup. So there's my guitar string, and the inductor coil consists of a bobbin with wire wrapped around it. In fact, there are n turns of wire, and there's also a permanent magnet either in or kind of around the bobbin, and that magnet actually magnetizes the metal guitar string and M is the strength of the string considered as a magnet. And it's not really important that the permanent magnet is in the bobbin, although that is a convenient place for it, it's only important that the string is magnetized. And when the string vibrates, this whole thing reduces to this demo you might have seen, where moving a magnet in the vicinity of a coil of wires creates a voltage between the two ends of that wire. Except that here, the string is the magnet, and here's the voltage. And when I say that I want a stronger coil, what I mean is I want more voltage here. And so this turns out to be fairly easy to analyze, and it's easy to show that the voltage is just proportional to the number of turns times the strength of the magnet M. So to get a higher voltage, I should first of all just use the strongest magnet possible, at least in theory. Although in practice, if you use a magnet that's too strong, it kind of makes the string vibrate funny. So I guess you should just use the strongest magnet that doesn't make that happen. And then I can also increase the voltage by just increasing the number of turns of wire I have around the bobbin. And I'll show the mathematics of this when I analyze the output coil, but it should be clear, at least intuitively, that you should just use the thinnest wire that you possibly can so that you can wrap bajillions of turns of wire around your bobbin before it's full. And as you can see, that does appear to be how they make guitar pickups. And so just looking at this input coil that I was using in my last video, you can immediately see what the problem is. There just aren't that many turns of wire. They could have easily just kept going and filled up all this extra empty space with wire. And I think the magnet could be stronger. And so just for the sake of comparison, here's the input coil from my last video plotted in green against just a normal guitar pickup plotted in blue. And you can see the pickup outputs several times more voltage, just owing to all those extra turns of wire. So just to summarize, for the input coil, you want the strongest magnet that doesn't interfere with the vibration of the string, and you want as many turns of the thinnest wire that you possibly can work with. So now I'll analyze the output coil, which I'm going to use as an actuator to actually push and pull on the guitar string. So again, I have a metal guitar string, and I have a bobbin with n turns of wire on it, and I have a permanent magnet, which magnetizes the guitar string, and again, the fact of the magnet being in the coil doesn't matter. But this time, I'm gonna send an electrical current, I, through the wire, and that current is going to induce a magnetic field, B, in the vicinity of the coil, and that magnetic field will either push or pull on the string considered as a magnet, depending on which way the current is flowing. But anyway, it's ultimately this magnetic field B that makes the string vibrate. So when I say I want a stronger coil, in this case, what I mean is that I want a stronger magnetic field. And the first question I have is that if I just have a given bobbin, like say I just have a guitar pickup with the wire removed, what diameter wire should I use to fill it back up with? And should I fill it all the way or should I only fill it part way? And to start with, it's fairly easy to derive that the magnetic field strength is going to be proportional to the number of turns and to the amount of current. 
And by Ohm's law, the current is proportional to one over the resistance in the wire. And when I talk about the resistance, what I mean is that I want to uncoil the wire from the bobbin and stretch it out straight. Then it has some length L and a diameter D. And its resistance is proportional to the length if you have a longer wire, it'll have more resistance. And it's proportional to 1 over the diameter squared. And that's because it has to do with the cross-sectional area of the wire. If you double the area, then you have the resistance. But note also that the length of the wire is also proportional to the number of turns because if you wrap the wire one more time around the bobbin, that's going to take so much more length of wire to do that. And so now we've come full circle back to N, but what is N? How many turns of wire are there going to be on the bobbin? And to analyze that, I want to take a cross section sort of out of the side of the bobbin, like this. And in two dimensions, that might look something like this, where each orange circle represents one turn of wire as it punctures through the plane of my cross section. And of course, this wire still has diameter D, and if my goal is just to completely fill the bobbin with wire, whatever wire I have and however much wire it takes, then notice that if I use a wire that has half of the diameter, it's going to take four times as many turns of wire to fill the bobbin up. So the number of turns is proportional to 1 over d squared. Well, if the number of turns goes with 1 over d squared, then certainly the length of the wire also goes with 1 over d squared, which means that the resistance goes with 1 over d to the fourth, which means the current just goes with d to the fourth. And then up here, I already told you that the number of turns is 1 over d squared, and the current is d to the fourth, and so that simplifies to d squared. And so this is kind of the result that I was looking for, that the strength of the magnetic field is proportional to the diameter of the wire squared. And what this kind of says is that in order to get the strongest magnetic field or the strongest coil is that I should just use the thickest wire that I possibly can. In fact, I might as well just use one chunk of this huge diameter wire that completely fills up the bobbin in only one turn. And that's a little bit counterintuitive because now I only have one turn of wire, which I guess is hurting me in some sense. But on the other hand, this chunky piece of wire has almost no resistance, which means that a huge amount of current is going to flow through it, more than enough to offset the fact that there's only one turn. And while it's true that in theory this will give you the strongest magnetic field, in practice you're not going to be able to build circuitry to drive an infinite amount of current through a zero resistance wire, and it would be overkill anyway. But you will be able to build circuitry to drive a few hundred milliamps of current through a 4, 8, or 16 ohm coil because those are common speaker resistances. So what you should do is choose the lowest resistance that you can actually work with, say 8 ohms, and then use the thickest wire that you can such that 8 ohms of that wire just completely fills up the bobbin. So the preceding analysis kind of assumes that you already have a bobbin and you just want to fill it up with wire. But what if you don't have a bobbin and you just want to know what size bobbin should you use in the first place? Is it better to make the coil big or small? Well, suppose that you have some bobbin and it's filled exactly with 8 ohms of wire. What's going to happen if I use a bigger bobbin but also fill it up with 8 ohms of wire? Well, you can see just by looking at this equation over here that clearly you're going to need wire that has a little bit bigger diameter and a lot more length, which means that there are going to be more turns of wire. And I'll leave it to you to work it out in the comments if you're interested how much more length and diameter you're going to need as the cross-sectional area of the bobbin increases. But it might, for example, look something like this. And since the resistance is the same, the same amount of current is going to flow in both of these inductors, but the bigger one has more turns, which means that the magnetic field is going to be stronger. And of course, that's what I'm trying to accomplish. 
Of course, if your bobbin is too big, then your magnetic field is going to be spread out all over the place. So what you really want is a bobbin that is small enough that it concentrates the magnetic field in the area where you want it, and then as big as possible within that constraint so that you can maximize the number of turns of wire that you have on it. And again, just looking at this output coil that I used in my last video, you can see what the problem is, mainly just that it's a teeny tiny coil. This is a 16 ohm coil, and maybe an 8 ohm coil would have been better, but 16 ohms is fine, but it would have been better had they used larger diameter wire, which would have necessitated more turns to get all the way up to 16 ohms, and that would have resulted in that stronger magnetic field that I'm after. And so just to recap, here's what you want to do for the output coil. You want to select a coil of the lowest resistance that you're able to work with practically, maybe 4, 8, or 16 ohms. And you also want to select the largest bobbin that is at least small enough to kind of concentrate the magnetic field in the area where you want it. And then you want to find a wire diameter so that a length of the wire with the desired resistance also just completely fills up the bobbin. And then again, you are going to want the strongest magnet that you can get in there that doesn't interfere with the vibration of the string. Yeah, so that's it. Those are the principles that you need to know in order to make the strongest possible inductor coils for your DIY guitar sustainer. And what I'd like to do in my next video is actually use these principles to make some better coils. And in particular, I'd like to try making a Sustainiac type device where I rewind the coils of a regular guitar pickup. And I want to see if I can use that to try to vibrate several strings on my Fulgorian harp all at once. But anyway, I think that's quite enough for today. So as usual, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye!